Two thirds of the earth is covered by water, a world full of life, but fraught with danger. Down below, it's risky to travel alone, but there's often safety in numbers. Many sea creatures help to protect each other by forming special alliances with their neighbors. In the ocean, there are many good reasons for having friends. Finding a meal or a mate, fighting off enemies and defending territory. All these things are easier if you stick together. Many fish swim in large shoals and seem to operate as one. There's no obvious leader, but each individual follows the next, barely a fin's length away. For small fish, this is the best way to stay in one piece. It's hard for a predator to pick out a single victim, and even then, the chances are it won't be you. This group has a definite leader, but it's still a team effort. As a storm approaches, spiny lobsters make a dash for deeper, calmer waters. Each individual is a vital link in the chain, hooking barbed antennae onto the one in front and moving on four pairs of legs apiece. safer than going solo. One has been left behind, but it's not alone for long. These are enemies, not friends. Disabling a lobster is easy for them. Trigger fish have small yet powerful jaws and sharp teeth able to pierce the lobster's armor. They attack a mouthful at a time. It's death by a thousand cuts. The smaller the fish, the more it benefits from the security of a shoal. With thousands of allies, a single sardine is lost in the crowd. But a shoal is easy for predators to spot, especially when the fish make for the ocean surface. These sardines have scales like tiny mirrors that flash in the sunlight, an irresistible kaleidoscope. The sea lion may be hungry or just curious. Either way, it finds the shoal elusive. In these bright surface waters, though the risk is greater, the sardines take the chance because this is where they find their favorite food, tiny red shrimp-like creatures called krill. Gathering in hunting mode, the shoal gangs up to trap the krill against the ocean surface. But the commotion brings competition.
blue sharks bury their faces in the bright red bundle, taking advantage of the sardines' hard work. With the krill so conveniently packaged for them, the sharks can't be bothered with sardines. So for once, predator and prey dine together in a strange liaison. Afterwards, the sardines return to deeper water in a close formation called a bait ball. But suddenly they're on the run. Striped marlin move in for the kill, herding the sardines into an ever tighter ball. They're joined by a sailfish with a larger dorsal fin than its relations. Predators work together, taking turns to pierce the center of the sardine ball in an attempt to feed. But they only have small mouths, and their target shifts like quicksilver. Eventually, the marlin forced the sardines to the surface, trapping them just as they had trapped the krill. Now the shoal comes under fire from both sides. Marlin below, pelicans and gulls above. Only a small group of sardines remain, having lost all the advantages of the school. And still the marlin persist. Shoaling isn't only about defense. It's also good for hunting. A school of big-eyed jack can easily overwhelm smaller fish. They strike like a whirlwind, leaving no way out. Once again, the ocean surface becomes a barrier, trapping the prey. Fish aren't the only sea creatures that live in large groups. Some marine mammals do too, in particular dolphins. White-sided dolphin schools are the biggest, up to 4,000 individuals. They follow the fast-moving tuna at speeds of 20 kilometers an hour or more. Communal lifestyle has many advantages, especially the protection it offers the young. 
an extended family of parents, aunts and uncles, brothers and sisters, are all on hand to help if necessary. Dolphins are loyal friends. They've been known to support a companion unable to swim. Succeeding as a group also depends on being able to communicate. Dolphins have evolved a special underwater language made up of clicks and whistles. They also keep in touch with a kind of underwater sonar called echolocation. The main purpose is for finding food and detecting any threats to the community, such as sharks. But it's also useful to let one dolphin know where the others are. Whales, too, spend their lives with friends and family. Pilot whales are about three times as big as dolphins and also form close-knit schools of several hundred. This mother and father are careful to ensure their youngster can keep up. Other sea creatures spend most of their lives alone and only come together for special events. Marbled stingrays meet up several times a year, not to feed or for protection, but to mate. On this occasion, something's not quite right. All the participants are males except for one large female, the center of attention. Tired of being pestered, she heads out in search of peace and quiet, but she can't shake off her queue of eager suitors. More females will probably turn up soon. In the meantime, each male clings to the hope that he'll be chosen, even at odds of a hundred to one. Sometimes mating takes place only once a year. For bat rays, it's a social highlight no one can afford to miss. As the time approaches, they rise from their sleep to join the throng. Thousands of bat rays come from far across the ocean to a special meeting place, and as night falls, they begin their courtship dance. Gradually, couples pair off. The smaller male approaches a potential partner, gently rubbing against her belly and trying to slow her down. Finally, she allows him to mate, on the wing as it were. Afterwards, male and female separate and rejoin the party. All night long, the dance continues. Then at dawn, the exhausted rays return to their solitary ways. Until next year.
Hammerhead sharks prefer to mate by day and wait for sunrise to begin their courtship ritual. They're heading upwards, not to the surface, but to the top of an underwater pinnacle. At the summit, they gather in their hundreds, high above the ocean floor, drawn together by the urge to reproduce. For once, small fish have nothing to fear. The sharks ignore them. Right now, they only have one thing on their minds. A male and female find each other and embrace. But as soon as they stop swimming, they start to sink. This relationship hits the rocks. Mating over for another year, the hammerheads disperse, some in search of a different kind of alliance. A group of butterfly fish are waiting. They're known as cleaners or barbers and are the shark's personal grooming service. Nearby, king angelfish perform the same task. These eager attendants bite off parasites and bits of dead tissue, which might otherwise become an irritation. Their client slows right down to help the process. It seems a risky business, yet this strange relationship keeps both sides happy. Cleaners get a free lunch, while the shark resists its normal urge to eat them. White tip reef sharks also have problem skin. They visit a special pit stop where banded gobies come out to service them. The tiny gobies work in crews, scouring the shark's rough skin. They're even confident enough to clean between its teeth. The gobies don't have long. When a shark stops swimming, it's hard for it to get enough oxygen through the gills. Soon it must leave to catch a breath. Barber fish service a wide variety of clients, but some liaisons are more dangerous than others. Before the barracuda gets an appointment, it has to reassure the barbers that it won't attack. The signal is to turn from silver to black. A lined goby is convinced and gets to work. Yet one false move could be fatal. A little spit and polish is important even for smaller fish. Dirty scales can slow them down. These sea chubs have come to a special place on the reef where black-nosed butterfly fish and other barbers congregate, a regular ocean cleaning station. 
the butterfly fish use their snouts like miniature vacuum cleaners. Convict tangs and yellow tangs are also on the lookout for a meal. They pass the time nibbling algae from the reef. Until every now and then, an alternative source of food appears from the blue. A green turtle heading for the cleaning station, one particular outcrop in all the vast ocean. The turtle is carrying excess baggage, too much green algae, and requires the delicate attentions of the hungry barberfish. one very satisfied customer. The turtle needs to return to the surface to breathe, but as yet can hardly tear itself away. It may have been a regular client at this barber shop, for the last three quarters of a century. In the open ocean, it's harder to find a meeting point. Drifting kelp weed can serve as a refuge and makeshift cleaning station. The weed is a haven for vulnerable baby fish and adults too. Half moon perch, for example. And one of the sea's most bizarre inhabitants, the ocean sunfish. The sunfish looks like one enormous head with no real backside or tail. As it gets older, it sheds scale after scale, and the bald, leathery skin attracts parasites. So anyone in need of a nibble is welcome. There's a lot of skin to clean. Sunfish can grow to over three meters long and two wide and weigh over a ton. In fact, they can outgrow every fish in the sea apart from sharks. Back on the reef, a tiger grouper checks into the cleaning bay and shark-nosed gobies rush in to serve. Once again, the pact between client and cleaner keeps the little gobies safe. The grouper's teeth present no threat. Nearby, rivals have set up shop. Pedersen shrimp. A Nassau grouper stops for a wash and brush up. Pinces poised, the shrimp approaches its client and the grouper darkens in color to guarantee its safety.
With this open invitation, the shrimp can feed all over the grouper's body, including critical zones such as the eyes and mouth. It even has access to the ultra-sensitive gills. Creatures with no fixed address can carry their assistance with them. Giant purple jellyfish, some five meters long, drift through the open ocean with a more or less permanent entourage. Plankton caught in the jelly's mucus coating makes a hearty meal. Like most hangers-on, this one cleans and polishes in return for board and lodging. Perhaps those tassels act as feather dusters. Others live in the jelly's shadow as protection from their many predators. Juvenile jackfish aren't completely immune to the stinging tentacles, but they're better off here than in the open water. The sting deters their enemies, and the tentacles make effective camouflage. All kinds of unlikely sea creatures live together as special allies. Out of the deep glides a manta ray, at least four meters across. These huge wings provide a mantle of protection for smaller fish usually wary of the open ocean. As the manta scoops water to collect plankton, a clarion angelfish boldly picks at its skin. The manta needs to keep its streamlined body smooth and slows down to encourage the angelfish. Job done, the ray accelerates again, and the angelfish tries to glean a last few morsels. Manta rays rarely travel alone, however. Each has permanent passengers, one or more remoras. The travelling companion is completely dependent on the manta, but offers nothing in return. The rays try twisting and turning to shake them off. to no avail. The remora's dorsal fin has evolved into a suction disc, which is used for holding on. Aboard its giant host, the remora has an easy ride across the ocean, picking up leftovers from the manta's meals. Ridges on the suction disc create a powerful vacuum so the remora rarely comes unstuck, even upside down. The manta has little choice. Whichever way it turns, the remora simply goes with the flow.
another kind of ray, and another annoying sidekick. The bar jack can't stick on, but it's just as hard to shake off. While the stingray seems to get little from this alliance, it's a gold mine for the jack. The stingray eats shellfish, excavated from the sand. In the process, smaller shrimp and fish are also exposed. All the bar jack has to do is be ready for them. The jack is very possessive of its convenient relationship. The dark colouring warns potential rivals to stay away. When another bar jack tries to get in on the act, a confrontation is inevitable. Despite all this posturing, no one is hurt. Eventually, the rival is defeated, and the first jack rejoins its reluctant partner. It's not just relationships that need defending. Some underwater conflicts begin over the dinner menu. A sheep's head fish has found a tasty urchin and isn't about to let the meal be swiped from under its nose. The situation is resolved by a kind of silent shouting match. To the oddly named sarcastic fringe head, a new home is worth fighting for. It scans the reef for a good location, the perfect coral hideaway. Just the thing. But there's a problem. The fringe head has invaded someone else's personal space. The neighbor from hell. Suddenly, tempers flare. It's simple. The one with the biggest mouth will win. When you're alone in the world, you've got to stand up for yourself. The male Garibaldi fish defends his turf against unwanted visitors, both plants and animals. He tends a special garden of red algae, 
a nest to attract a mate. It works. A passing female is interested and pops in for an inspection. She's impressed and lays her eggs in the algae. But as soon as she's finished, the male chases her away. The father will now take full responsibility until his small fry hatch in a few weeks' time. First, he fertilizes the batch of eggs. Then he goes back to warding off unwelcome visitors. He takes no chances. Even this slow motion predator is dropped off far away from the nest. With so much coming and going, there's no peace for the Garibaldi. The next trespassers are a school of senorita fish. Finally, he takes a break. But just as it seems the coast is clear, a more serious threat appears. A baby octopus. The octopus plops down a little too close to the Garibaldi's garden. And won't be budged. Eventually, white with frustration, the octopus fires a smoke screen of ink and makes a getaway. The Garibaldi has saved his eggs and algae. Ancient liaisons between algae and primitive animals founded the complex coral reefs. Coral may look like a plant, but that's not so. It's animal and a predator like any other, feeding and growing to form layer upon layer of spectacular shapes and patterns. Coral tentacles reach out to capture bits of food. But coral needs more than plankton to survive. Green plants inhabit its maze of tissues, microscopic algae that produce essential nutrients to help the coral grow. In exchange, the algae get a niche for life. This bond between plant and animal began some 450 million years ago and is still going strong. Today, the reef is a haven for many other creatures, from a blenny in need of a burrow to a seahorse pulled by the current. Survival depends on give and take. The Red Sea urchin may eat Garibaldi eggs, but once the eggs have hatched, an urchin becomes a sanctuary for the juvenile Garibaldis. Although these spines are dangerous, they're still the safest option for the Garibaldis. All over the reef are surprising partnerships. 
there's more to these hydrocorals than meets the eye. They're homes for staghorn hermit crabs. The hermits once had shells of their own. Then the corals took over, dissolving the shells away. Nevertheless, the hermit is so at home, it even has its own trapdoor, made from a modified claw. In return, the coral is transported to new feeding grounds. Crabs are always looking for the best disguise to confuse the many crab eaters in the ocean. They often team up with less mobile creatures, a sponge, for example. It's a difficult balancing act, however, and the slightest wobble might give the game away to a hungry predator. Sponge and crab are two animals living together. These anemones, hermit crab and seashell are involved in a three-way alliance. When a bigger conch shell attracts the hermit, it's all change. First, the hermit checks there's no one else inside. Then tries the shell for size. A perfect fit. But the hermit needs its anemones to move in too. They're ocean allies. The anemone's stinging tentacles put crab eaters off and the hermit shows its gratitude by throwing scraps of food their way. The hermit gently prods the anemones into letting go, so they can be replanted at their new address. Anemones make good companions for small fish too, as long as they're immune to the stings. The clown anemone fish is covered in a thick mucus to shield it from the venom in these tentacles, so it can dive back safely into the anemone's arms whenever danger threatens. There are several varieties of anemone and anemone fish. All bear coats of many colors that warn enemies off. In return, the fish keep the anemone's tentacles free of debris. This deal works well with other neighbors too, such as the porcelain crab, busy filtering plankton from the water with its fans. Being transparent is an advantage, and it always helps to have an accomplice. Shrimps, like the other tenants, keep the anemone clean and tidy. Yet some relationships seem totally one-sided. The sea cucumber trawls the sea grass beds for particles of food, shadowed by a very different companion, the tiny pearlfish. The pearlfish feeds at night. If it senses trouble, it has a most unusual hiding place.
it finds the sea cucumber's anus with its nose. Then turns around and slips inside, tail first. What its host gets out of this, who knows? Another unequal partnership. A sheep crab carrying so many friends it can hardly move. Barnacles can't go anywhere on their own, but stuck to the sheep crab shell, they're moved from place to place. This way they can catch a greater variety of food. With kelp on board as well, the crab is looking overworked. It seems a high price to pay for a bit of camouflage. Barnacles will stow away on virtually anything that moves from a piece of driftwood to a whale. However, they're a burden the whale can do without. So perhaps it can knock them off by diving through the kelp? A mature grey whale may be 15 metres long, and as the years go by, most of its body is covered in a thick barnacle crust. Scientists can recognise individual whales from their scars. When the barnacles get too much, the whale tries a different tactic. It seeks out a gravelly spot on the ocean floor and rubs and scrapes in an effort to exfoliate. This method doesn't seem particularly successful, however. What the whale really needs is a personal team of cleaner fish. But this job is just too big. Most other problems sea creatures face can be solved with a little help from their friends or relations. In a world where danger is all around, there's comfort in knowing you're not alone. Even the smallest individual can find strength in numbers. So often, the key to survival is to work together with your ocean allies. <laughs>